the season begins in earnest here uh, tonight. Uh, we're really happy to have Matt uh, Kirkpatrick and Miles Holder reading for us tonight. Uh, if you haven't gotten a schedule, please get one and take a look. Next week we have a uh, wonderful bass player, uh, Ken Critchfield, playing for us and doing some sort of performance art piece. I don't know what's going to happen. He's been doing for years this thing called Seraphim, which was sort of part spoken word and part improvisatory jazz. I don't know what he's going to do next week, but it should be really interesting. He's a very talented and smart individual. And he's uh, uh, going to be performing with uh, Max Werner, who is going to be reading from his book. Uh, in two weeks, three weeks actually, because we, we have two more Wednesdays in September. So in October, Laura Canland and her husband Christian Asplin will be uh, performing too. Laura Canland is a wonderful poet, and her husband is a musician and composer, and that's going to be an interesting night too. They have a project where he's doing music and she's reading uh, poetry over the top, so some really interesting multimedia stuff going on. Uh, on the 20th, it's Shannon Ballum and Brian uh, Kubaritz. Uh, and then the 20th is Britta Meal and Michael McGriff. So October is pretty darn good. Uh, come out for some of that. If I don't remember this, Pax wanted me to say that we are now taking audience donations on our website. We actually have, is it PayPal? Is that what we're doing? Which is cool. So if you want to donate a buck or 6,000, you know, to, we may need it with the recession on. We do want to keep these things going, and if, if you have a little bit to spare, check that out. Uh, tonight we're going to have Miles Fuller read at first, and uh, Matthew uh, Kirk, Kirkpatrick second. Uh, Miles Fuller was a student of mine at Copper Hills many, many years ago, and I was thinking about this the other day that uh, you know, as teachers, all we can do is you know sort of show them what we know, and you kind of show them everything you know, and you talk to them about poetry, talk to them about their poems and so on, and then you realize that you send them out into the world and they have to do something with it past that, and they will make their own way, and they will become their own writers. Uh, Miles Fuller has done that uh, in extraordinary ways, in lots of extraordinary ways. He did wonderful poetry at Westminster College, working with Natasha Saie, and then in the process started writing nonfiction prose, and ended up in the uh, MFA program in nonfiction at the University of Iowa recently. Uh, so that's what he's been doing, and he did incredible things on his own beyond what I could possibly give him. Uh, his poetry and prose have uh, received accolades from the Academy of American Poets, AWP, Pushcart nomination, honorable mention of the best American essays, and most recently, uh, the 2010 Alligator Juniper Essay Prize was his. Uh, his poems and essays have appeared in the Bellingham Review, Quarterly West, Portland Review, and Ellipsis. Uh, he is also a, an instructor at the University of Iowa, where he is finishing and working on his MFA, I guess. Uh, please welcome my friend, Miles Ford. I don't write in one genre. I'm kind of a genre pervert, and I can't stick to one without uh, colluding with the others. So um, uh, I'm in this nonfiction MFA at Iowa, and I haven't written more fiction um, than ever in my life. And I start with poetry, so I'm going to read from poetry, nonfiction, and fiction a few short things. If that's cool. Everybody in agreement? <laughs> we have a consensus. This is a democracy. <laughs> and uh, my uh, printer printed in a font that I can only describe as uh, ransom note. So I'll try my best to read it. <laughs> This is cut out from the newspaper. It's all very ominous. Um, okay, um, I will begin with, can everybody hear okay? Uh, if you can't, just wave wildly, and just like you're sinking. An international sign of choking, or I can't hear at the reading. Um, I'll, I'll start with nonfiction, uh, because that's what I've been uh, uh, drowning in this past year. Uh, this is a short section from uh, a series called Stations of the West, which is based on Stations of the Cross. Heavy handed, I know. Um, uh, but just this, Stations of, of uh, the Western United States experience, or at least my experience of it. And uh, so this is, I guess, if you had to align it with one, this is maybe the, the Veronica, or uh, Veronica Weiss, she used to face. 
The green river gushed like the birthday girl between the deep granite of its containment, beginning below the flaming gorge dam as it ran for seven and a half miles of trout pools and class four rapids, then dissipated into the heat of the red desert that wasn't the only red desert. But the river gathered its nutrients into sludge, laboring down river with the consistency of lentil soup. Here, the devil had a rock. Here, he had a canyon. The rock stayed capillary red in daylight, throbbed against the decapitated earth of the plateaus by sunset. Here, we lunged toward nightfall in leaky old town canoes. And here, we found the wildest dogs, coyotes tugging at the grass near our tents like charging bulls. Near the river, we left them food and let their tongues come close. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, switch gears and read some poetry, if that's OK. Again, the consensus, everybody, smile wide. Thank you. These are all new poems uh, from uh, a series of depositions from reluctant lovers, be like people that don't want to talk about their relationships. And, uh, and I, I just interview them in my mind. Um, first one. As I apply this lipstick, it's smearing into the starred shape of your mother's birthmark. Glow. A sunflower. It dries up her nocturnal thirst. Liver. There's the organ of true contentment in self-sacrifice. It's not weak, it's surviving. Yes! We're, we're kind to the rapist with a daughter. Just look at those knockers. Just look at those eyes. I'm in the tank of water. With a mirror, I found a body. I'm in your favorite box. It's a cigarette case your mother wept into. She whimpered as her lips trembled around me. Disbelieve my intentions. Distill what I say into, I wanted her because it's easy and ease is, slipper is slipperier and then the bristled tongue of a new desire. She couldn't remember how sunlight begged, but it begged us to stop. Another. This has two sections, two voices. And uh, let's better hope it's not dark and scary, because I think it is. <laughs> um, one. This yellow house rigged for a watery passage. When one form overlaps another, color changes. It's not an escape, it's a passage through. The geranium, the hibiscus tea, a town full of beautiful rubbish. Connecticut in the white summer, a slapstick form of humor, a negative bloom before each white carnation blossom launched forward and fluffy like a pie in the face. Milk of my sister's eyes, swollen with marigold, the art of shifting fear, or a sith of butter around the neck and elbows for her, and noodles of worms for the pleasing blue fish at dawn. Two. Sudden joy. A metallic paper clip pierced through his nub tongue. Artichoke supper pureed and buttery in the pepper grounds and bladed leaves for dipping, where the wildest peppers amped their seedy passion into this empty kitchen as that passion fills my lack of will more 
than my lack of him. Since the day I met you, I've been depressed. I blame this teacup and its razor edge. I blame this light bulb and how it flickers on the second. I blame childhood summer camps and the smell of pine on my shoes. I blame the sun and its neglect of our little white house. I blame all these things, but I won't blame you. You're the only force that dulls the edge of this teacup, tempers the bowl, hovering with your alpine curiosity just outside my door. I never imagined how big hell could sprawl. I just imagined, excuse me, I just assumed there'd be enough room for both of us to gossip as we do. Otherwise, we sleep with wildness until each night we roll like timber against the taming presence of the other. Give me a canyon, stick by stick, my sweet heart attack. Give me a sandstone cliff. You could give me the world one landmark at a time. Yet I'm tired. Those wretched other animals that mate for life with their fearless desire. I resent their pelts on the wall. Those creatures that didn't know where to look. Where are you now? I am asking of you this one thing. To realize our perfect scene for parting. Return to me then shoot, return, then alight to another nesting ground, little bird. Speak it back to me, little bird. Listen to yourself as I pull the nickel handle shut. Know we're still together, because I can hear you pecking against the other side of the door. The last uh, series of things I'll read are short stories. Um, I heard when I started writing fiction in January, that uh, for fiction and drama, uh, characters have to desire something, and then that desire gets frustrated, and uh, then we're all, yeah, Harry Potter, and then we get into it. <laughs> um, and I uh, thought, well, I'm going to try and write in fiction, but I think I can only get, get, get to the point where I figure out where a character desires something. And so I started writing um, this alphabet book. It's a very adult alphabet book. I, I wouldn't recommend it for children unless the child was me. Um, <laughs> and so uh, there, are these, there are these characters, um, and, and each one is in a different style, and it has to, uh, you'll see, um, begin and end with the same gesture, and I can't stop writing until I finish this little letter person. All right, so the first one I'll read is B, uh, because there's no use for A in the alphabet. B is for Bert. Bert Brent laughed again, his teeth unsheathed in the curl of a lounging dog. His sunglasses hugged the ridge of his brow like a canyon river between cliffs. When had he ever been so thrilled? She was the answer. She was no longer a plastic figurine, a leggy doll to him. She was witty and vibrant both in public and private. Bert no longer cared where they spoke together. It was all a miracle, and sometimes miracles need to go public to sway the unbelievers. He laughed because she was so staunch and political, yet she could stop in the careful moments of their time together and hold his slivery, and hold her slivery hand to his face, dwarfed against the sweep of stubble, like a climber on Mount Rushmore feeling Lincoln for a shave, and touch him hard, daggering her tiny unified fingers into his chin until his teeth ached, until there was nothing but acceptance and longing and a bus ride that luxuriated him emotionally in that it felt five stars and first class and full of the dramatic closeness you get in films. This was the first of the good days for Bert Brent. 
I'm going to skip around. Um, take it back. I'll go straight to C. Right to C. Um, C uh, is written phonetically in an accent, so I haven't tried it lately. But we'll see if I can uh, read the page and just get it done. All right. They're all in different styles, but this, this one you are, are unfortunate enough to be guinea pigs for. C is for Chloe. Chloe C were a real sexy bitch. Some days she couldn't find a better man than herself to get her off. She imagined them all lined up in the mirror. She bat her lips. There wasn't anything to do but wash and wash and hope it would all come round for her. She was so tired of being locked upward in this glicking hall. The coal cupboard frighted her too. She had lots of these pretty clothes on, and a whole bunch of sexy bard feathers, and her lucky strabbing foot was no bigger than her tongue, but it was bound to work. The windiest window was draft, but not big enough for her escape. She was bound when Carl Crothers came round. She was not frighted by his company no more. She needed men, she said, and he was a brutal oaf, but he was there with food and so much nicer than his old cook of a father before him. Magazines were cluttered up to catching corner, but she loved and hated the bright women on their covers. She wore a real sexy batch too. The men's and the mags were hers for the taking. She would marry the one who matched her sweet rum. The guy who needed her and wanted her, but not locked her up this time. The magazine man she would find and would cage him up with his pretty hair and big arms all for herself. This was the final dream of Chloe C. D is for Drake. Drake Downington Danforth is not a name. It's a whole fucking law firm. <laughs> <laughs> On a brass sign outside, or the one in the lobby directing you to Suite 103, there's a hyphen and an and symbol, as if there is actually an individual I in firm. Rewind all your favorite episodes of Perry Mason, because you're going to want to watch those afterward. Drake, Downington, and Danforth are not criminal attorneys. They don't golf with the mayor. They don't golf with your mother, not anymore. And the billboard you saw that made you briefly daydream about a dog bite, one that oozed enough to create its own mouth, or to just wreck your Ford Focus against a drunken heiress, all because the money and pain is so good and some lawyers can grip the feedback off those smug little insurance ponies and squeeze out a lifetime of meals for you. Forget it. What, what Drake, Downington, and Danforth do is make sure that after you're done masturbating with your own porcelain hand, Asians can still import lead-based stoneware for you. Just for you. Drake, Downington, and Danforth are import attorneys. They're the brave civilians negotiating contracts evading taxes and sanctions, and opening the gates of commerce to all the sweet-ass contaminants. We thank, the, we thank them daily. Your sister who works at the Bed Bath & Beyond, a name that supposes there has ever been a bed or bath that didn't also transport us beyond, owes them her job. And we get the goods. Most of us can finally eat fat burgers on our floral prints and silently the Triple D firm takes no credit. At least, that's how it went before the wind brought the water and the water brought a flood. That was life before the big god found out about Drake, Downington, and Danforth. E. E is for Elaine. There are only a few more of these, so just buckle up and just hold tight, don't make it up. He is for Elaine. Elaine and her way coughed blood on occasion. The sight of it was pure theater, and she became the best in this stage of illness. For some, a bedpan is just a bedpan, no matter what you put in it. Yet Elaine once lifted up such a tub and breathed out the words, Art thou feared? How does thy song cast away its listener as the sea for the shipwrecked? Come, Bile, do not recoil from my love. Hearken me back into thy bright vessel. For remember, sweet Bile, I am your mother, and in the reflection of thy pools, 
you are born of me again. Elaine could make a dry heave sound like a page from the tempest. But this one hurt. She hacked out a giggle. Elaine remembered how her university roommate Fanny and she spoke to each other in the most gorgeous artifice, exchanging verse like schools of Elizabethan minnows between them, such as, shall I compare thee to an anal rape? Or come, come bright star, you have made a cuckold of me, believing that language was such a good joke because it was more beautiful than its first human speaker ever intended. Now, on the linoleum checkered in pale blue, the texture of its cold and its softness that felt like her own hands, Elaine curled onto the bathroom floor. Not sick at all, really, just sick of the bed. Sick of the bed and its cheeky partner, the pan. Sick of that ambivalent little basin she spoke to so intimately with her fluids the one who served as her silent analyst, listening to every drop of her body's childish refusals. I want to puke like a person near the tub. She said aloud, growing less eloquent as her elbows burrowed deeper against her own warmth, and she lay herself down on that dimpled coolness of the floor. Elaine's one secret indulgence, lying there, she liked to imagine that through the layers and sub-layers of the house, through the earth's crust and all the hot metals between her and the other side of the earth, was land. And on that land, in the same spot, a woman with red hair was pressing her ear to the ground just to listen, waiting for the spoken sonnets of Elaine and her way. I'm gonna read a couple more, that's okay. F, F is for Fanny. Fanny Finlayson obeyed. She obeyed traffic laws. Colored lights and sirens belonged to the rest of them. The rest of them in this precious town of Pigs Willow with their bump bump stereos and the stickers of the obscene. The police should block up the entire town. All except Fanny, of course. She knew beauty came from practice and obedience. She could stitch the torn seam of a Sunday dress with one cochlea-shaped pole, and with that darling daisy print still on. Lock them up, she thought. They don't understand such things. Colored lights and sirens were for the heathen, the seedy highway speeders, the knocked-up night dancers, and the alleyway Johnny suckers we've been warned about, warned about through the news and the Bible, and that compass God put in our chest to know things. Fanny Finlayson knew better than to do the shopping on our Lord's Day. His day is Sunday. That part hadn't changed. But on this morning, as she whooshed eight miles above the posted limit and RPM jittered through a yellow light, she felt a tiny bird of sin pick, picking away at her, like she was a lump of delicious seed, picking her clean, and it felt becoming on her, this new nothing consumed by the bird of sin. The toe of her white high heel stamps the pedal. Her engine hunkers past 38, 42, maybe 50. She roars onward to the food line so she can pretend to look for strawberries and see if Frank is there. She is going to introduce herself as so much more than Fanny Finlayson. And I'll read one more. V is for Vera. Vera Vangelis morphed into a light bulb at the age of 13. She did not have an epiphany or ignite with any light bulb notion in this stage of her pubescence. The transformation was deliberate, actual, and complete. Vera decided while in an antique store with her father and her cousin Vander that a light bulb was the most giving form spherical with as many points of exit and access, yet bulbs often found protection, as scones are shaded in some way because of their giving nature. Vera, so vulnerable. 
Vera, the radiant. She, the one who needed more indirect use. She welcomed her new life. And this new life, unintended, would only serve her turned on. So Vera grew into a 75 watt bulb of the halogen variety. Simple as that. Simple as a switch. Miss Vangelis, a young lady of 13, previously ordinary with numb tits and bag baggy clothes, became a brilliant bull. And then the bareness shone. And then happened as it often does. Down from the child's small child's bedroom with its dotted periwinkle walls, down the phallic hallway of home, and down the stairway with carpet as thick and brown as a cascade of chocolate from 1979. Perhaps Vera remembered how she kissed her cousin, banned her hard and light atop in this spot. Vera, the new bull, was carried down the kissing stairs beneath the house and into her new installment of neglect. Down here where the black widows build webs for swinging, here where secondhand skis lose their slope, Vera, the radiant, plugged into a basement room. This space where only the rarest hands can engage her light from a bead ball chain. I think I put her here. Maybe when I decided I could be a ghost, my cousin decided she was a bull. With only a memory of hands, I close around her chain, clasp it over and over wishing I could harm this floor again, give it all the raw wattage of Vera Vangelis. Thank you. So much equipment to walk around. <coughs> I'm out of breath. Um, City Art is sponsored by the Salt Lake City Arts Council, the Utah Arts Council, Zoo Arts and Parks, and X Mission, and audience donations. Uh, maybe Miles needs a PayPal so he can get a new printer cartridge too. I mean, that would be help him out and print and read without the goggles and stuff. Um, Matthew Kirkpatrick. Oh, I should say this too before, before I do this. I'm going to put a little piece of paper because I, I have a lot of pieces of paper up here as an open read list. And so if you brought something or if you have something in your head that you would like to read after the featured reading, we'd be glad to have you do that. Um, I'll put that up as soon as uh, Matthew's done tonight. Glad to have Matthew Kirkpatrick. He is uh, doing multimedia, which is always exciting, exciting here. I can't wait to see what he's going to do. Uh, Matthew Kirkpatrick's fiction has appeared recently or is forthcoming in conjunctions. Western Humanities Review, Copper Nickel, uh, read, is it Redivire? 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 Yeah. Um, uh, Gargoyle, uh, the Notre Dame Review, Diagram, and Elsewhere. He won the 2009 uh, Utah Regional Writers Competition, the Utah Arts Council, please, I think, uh, judged by Ben Marcus and was included in the uh, 2010 Best of the Web Anthology and 2009 and Now Awards Anthology. Uh, and he has been awarded a fellowship from the Virginia Center for Creative Arts as a PhD candidate uh, in literature and creative writing at the University of Utah. Please welcome Matthew Kirkpatrick. Um, I have the, the second, well, second two thirds of my reading include the slide projector, so uh, I'm going to save my banter, or the most of my banter, for the pause when the projector comes up. So, um, <laughs> First thing I'm going to read is uh, a small section from a novel I was working on before the reality of my PhD exam set in. It's about um, people who kill themselves at work. And this section <laughs> is about one of the dozen protagonists um, visiting his uh, prostitute. It's called The Sad Hand. <laughs> Champion sat on the edge of the prostitute's bed and listened to the sound of her sad name. He liked to watch the prelude especially, liked to watch her red lips quiver and her eyelids so tightly closed. The silence, too, of the room, soft and warm, helped him to focus. Cry for the children and their mother and the dog that died in the fire, he said. She sobbed a little sob. Champion leaned forward in expectation. She opened her eyes, now red, but not yet wet with tears. Give me a minute, okay? She closed her eyes again and showed him her clenched fists. She was trying. Champion appreciated the effort and awaited her constipated tears. He leaned forward in anticipation of authentic sadness. 
His feet only in brown dress socks, his shoes untied and next to one another at the edge of the bed, in the deep piles of the burgundy carpet, he felt only here warm. One reason he so often visited was for his cold feet and the softness of the bed with her and her bra and jeans, her bare feet, her unpainted toenails, her eyes fogged with deliberate tears. Cry for me for all those babies in that bus. Think of them bouncing around in there, flying through the windows and screaming as the bus falls off the cliff into the icy waters below, he said. <laughs> what? She opened her eyes. That didn't happen. Please, I'm paying for this. It, it's happening right now in my mind, he said. Bullshit, she whispered. She closed her eyes and wondered for the third time that day what had happened to the fucking. Most of her customers had stopped paying her to fuck them, instead asking her to perform various acts of what she had come to think of as emotional pornography. Most of, <laughs> most of her customers asked for sadness, but some, like Champion, asked for other emotions too. Laughter, anger, fear, angst, and her least favorite, and the most obnoxious request, despair. <laughs> she, she had long suspected her clients no longer felt anything for themselves. Plentiful tears streaked her cheeks, and lucky for Champion, who saw it as a sign of authentic sorrow, trickled over her lips and into her mouth, and so he relaxed. He sat with his back against the headboard, which felt loose to him. He would offer to fix it. <laughs> Champion would admit he used to enjoy fucking the prostitute, or trying to fuck the prostitute. Those fond memories contributed to his comfort in her apartment. More than the fucking, it was her portrayal of various emotions in the extreme that now gave him release. Release for him was intimately coupled with warmth, but also the clean decor of black, gray, and subtle splashes of dark red, the imitation mass-produced Danish modern furniture, and the prostitutes' stunning color photographs of wedding cakes. At first, she thought the cakes might bother her downtown day clients, the good customers she invited to her apartment, until they told her how much they liked them, how the cakes, the cakes gave them small pangs of something like feeling. Sometimes they told her they liked the photos because they made them feel guilty, or at least reminded them that they should feel guilty. <laughs> Most of them complained that the only thing they could feel was comfort, even though they wanted to feel other things too. They often asked her to feel guilty and would confess things from their own lives so she could feel guilty for them. When she told them she didn't know how to portray a physical expression of guiltiness, that she was not an actress really, they told her it was enough to tell them that she felt shame where they asked her to switch to anger. That helped, too. Champion was no different. He told her his assistant had killed himself, and he had walked past the body floating in the fountain in front of the office for three days straight, ignoring the dead assistant, even leaving him voicemail messages and reporting him for unexcused absences, <laughs> even though he knew he was dead. In addition to knowing he should feel guilty for ignoring his dead assistant, he also felt he should feel guilty for reporting his assistant for bad behavior at work, when he had a legitimate excuse. <laughs> I don't feel anything, really, except that I have to find a new assistant, and that bothers me. But on the other hand, Dale wasn't very good at much, he said. I'm not your therapist. Mm -hmm. But then, a new assistant might be okay. I don't really care. I just don't want to have to fill out any paperwork. I don't want to attend any meetings, but I also don't want to have to go to sensitivity training. It's not like he was murdered. He killed himself. What do you do, anyway, she asked. They sent me to the Gentle Hands facility for reorientation the last time something like this came up. That's what they called it, but it was really just a lot of sitting around and holding each other's hands. Reorientation, she asked. I'm working on a very important project. I can't tell you about it. That's fine. Your time's almost up. Do you want me to feel guilty for you, she asked. Sure. <laughs> I'm not sure what that looks like. Maybe a little like sadness, but also a little like despair, he said. I can try that. Can you shake your fists at the ceiling like you're cursing an angry god? He asked. <laughs> okay. After a bit of sobbing, Champion asked her if she had time for a little anger. She looked at the clock and saw that his hour was up. Are you ever going to pay for fucking again? She asked. I pay for fucking all the time. It's been months. I get, out, I get worn out by the crying. It's dehydrating. Why do you do it then? He asked. Because nobody pays for fucking anymore. I don't understand it. Can I have some tea? He asked. She stood and he followed her into the kitchen where she turned on the burner under the tea kettle. A fly flew around a dirty saucepan on the edge of the sink. Coffee grounds dusted the counter. Outside, the sky darkened. Against the window, thick balls of gray hail smacked against the glass. I just have green. 
That's fine. You need to be out of here in 15 minutes. I have another client coming. He handed her an envelope from his inside jacket pocket. Maybe on Friday I could get an hour? I'll let you know. Do you print these yourself? He nodded at one of her photographs. Nope, I wish the water would boil. <laughs> he watched her breasts and her beautiful body as she stood waiting for the water to boil. He felt a rare movement in his penis and wanted suddenly to put his arms around her, bend her over the counter, pull down her jeans, and fuck her in the kitchen. And even though he was paying her as a prostitute, something about this thought disgusted him after watching her perform so many motions over the weeks. It was, as if, it was as if they had crossed some territory now that their passionate phase was over and had entered a shorter phase of subdued intimacy. He didn't know how to go back, even though, as he was thinking it, he remembered that all that was between them was a transaction. On Friday, he would ask her to cry for him about the state of their relationship, the space between them, and the love they would never have. <laughs> Maybe then, he would ask her to have coffee with him, knowing she would refuse. He stood behind her close enough that a stray strand of, his hair, of her hair touched his cheek. He could put his arm around her and pull her toward him, but his time was up, and instead of closing the space between them, he waited for water that would never boil. All right, next up for the audio video part. <laughs> This is where I'll answer for a moment. Um, I want to announce the Writers at Work Fiction Contest, which has two, uh, two weeks, closes next Wednesday. Details at writersatwork.org. Um, I wanted to thank Joel and Miles, um, and also Lance and Andy for the loan, generous loan of the AV equipment, which seems to be coming up quickly. It seems dark. <laughs> ah, there, it's just warming up. Okay, that was fast. What's that? Oh, we could do. Okay, you can just hit. You can hit just the return button there. Okay. Um, and thanks, Susan, my my lovely assistant. <laughs> <laughs> and thank all of you, especially my students who uh, came tonight. Even though I told them it was unrequired, it actually is required. So Okay, these are my vacation photos. Um, <laughs> okay, this is a short story called Some Kirkpatricks. Over 500,000 people die in, in major Russian cities, the Philippines, and the Ottoman Empire during the sixth cholera pandemic. The inhalation of vaporized mercury is believed to be an effective treatment for syphilis. Pineapples, potatoes, and radishes are known to cure warts. Polio transmission is primarily oral fecal. Legionnaire's disease was not called Legionnaire's disease until an outbreak in 1976 infects attendees at an American Legion meeting in Philadelphia, leading to the discovery of a new strain of bacterium named Legionella, Legion, yeah, Legionella for the first identifiable carriers of Legionnaire's disease. Legionnaire's disease is named in honor of the Legionnaires who bravely contracted the Legionnaire's disease. <laughs> the mercury cure works by killing the patient. <laughs> Kirkpatrick leaves his mortal life on August 13, 1920. He is survived by his beloved wife, two sisters, two sons. He is preceded in death by his mother and father. Though it is believed that his soul was smaller than average, he is, he is a beloved father and will re be remembered for his kind smile and experiments with potatoes. <laughs> a small soul can slide through the gates of heaven undetected. The victims of flood, but not the great flood, the families of Kirkpatrick, the family of Kirkpatrick leaves their mortal lives on September 1st, 1905 their modest valley home devastated by cascading rain and thick walls of mud converging them on them while they sleep. Had they only heard the heavy wings of ascending crows warbling through the thick flood air, crows taking flight at night are flood harbingers. Harbingers? Waiting, wasting is the process by which we waste. Muscle and fat tissue melt together, skin slackens, stunting is acute, starvation, Chronic wasting is a transmissible spongiform encephalopathy, I swear I practiced these words, <laughs> uh, caused by preens and is found primarily in cervids. Tuberculosis is vampirism. Typhoid symptoms, malaise, rose red chest, in the cold night, stars burning through darkness, thick black blood down the canal of skin above the lips. Kirkpatrick left his mortal life on October 31st, 1857, 
survived by a daughter, a son, a wife, preceded in death by a mother and a father, suffered from arc eyes staring too long at the sun, fell from his bicycle and hit his head. Approximately 16 million people died in the Great War, 2,209 people died in the Great Flood. The hurricane of 1900 killed between 6 and 12,000 people. Fuchs dystrophy starts in the morning when the eye clouds. House finch eye disease kills millions of birds. Crows implicated, gastroenteritis, avian cholera, spores, flooding, onions protect against crows, apoplectic, died from stroke, died from a small hole burning through his heart, unknown causes. Scrofula can be cured by the touch of the King of England, the fluviatic, invented and patented a device for mimicking the sound of croaking bullfrogs in order to ease the onset of sleep. Leaves behind a family, a great Dane, a fragment of a red wool scarf knitted by his mother for his fifth birthday, tucked between blankets in the cedar chest at the foot of the bed. Broken bones mended by amputation, body badly burned. Survivors survive. Passed away at home, born, a member blessed, will be missed. Weight discrepancy, 33 pounds, 5 ounces. Eight discrepancy at death, 6,514 days. Difference of soul weight, 0.45 ounces, estimated. Kirkpatrick alone for 17 years, 10 months, 1 day. Kept track for 1 year, 3 months, 2 days. Never remarried. Vertical distance between bodies, 2.5 feet, approximate. Minor differentiators, emotional capacity, short-term memory, appetite, favorite child. Kirkpatrick, a survivor of the fifth cholera epidemic, succumbs to heart disease in 1937. August 5th, 1937, the Soviet Union begins the Great Purge. August 18th, 1937, Kirkpatrick notices minor influenza symptoms and postpones a visit with her sister to the Great Salt Lake. On September 2nd, 1937, 11,000 die in the Great Hong Kong Typhoon. At age 75, Kirkpatrick is hit by an ice cream truck walking from her parked car, a blue 1949 Dodge Coronet toward Woolworths to buy a new winter coat. Survived by daughters, a son, granddaughters, and a grandson who agrees to take care of Kirkpatrick's parakeet, Lester, and Dachshund's Lippy and Dashiell. <laughs> Kirkpatrick ordained December 17, 1944, U.S. Army chaplain, veteran, poor cook, Lazy Eye, visited Niagara Falls three times, dies winding his watch, experiences symptoms, dizziness, sensation of fullness in chest, sweating, shortness of breath, indigestion. Kirkpatrick awakens late in the morning of October 19, 1975. A strong wind rattles the windows, stands shirtless at the edge of the front porch, watching dust twist through the air. A rusty bicycle rests against a maple tree, a fallen branch scrapes along the road, blown by the steady wind, warm for October. He touches his left elbow with his right hand and rubs raw the dry skin. A cat sleeps beneath a parked car. Three potted chrysanthemums wilt unwatered on the concrete walk. A crow watches from a fork formed by thick tree branches. Forty-three die in the Moorgate tube crash on February 28, 1975, in London. 46 died during the October 6, 1976 massacre in Bangkok. February 1, 1974, fire in Sao Paulo kills 177 and later 11. February 17, 1974, soccer in Cairo kills 49. April 3, 1974, 149 tornadoes kill 315. September 9th, September 9th, 1974, a violent storm, Kirkpatrick alone, Kirkpatrick having died three years prior, the victim of unsolved violence. The lights light, then dark, then light again and again. A crow calls, stumbling through the kitchen, looking for the candle on the kitchen counter, knocks over a pitcher full of thin lemonade fresh that afternoon. The pitcher falls from the counter and shatters, glass shards beneath bare footfalls, falls against the counter and hits head on the edge slips onto the bare floor and fades, broken glass pushing into Kirkpatrick's cheeks. Behind the stove, a mouse begins to eat a mouse, dead in a trap. Kirkpatrick dies. Kirkpatrick is born. Kirkpatrick dies. Kirkpatrick opens the lock shop lock and carts the items on sale out onto the sidewalk, still wet from early rain. The smell of smoke drifting from a barrel fire deep in an alley two blocks away stains the morning air. The power lines above sag beneath the weight of crows. 
The cracks in the sidewalk slowly widen. Kirkpatrick arranges locks, boxes, and chains on the table, and again, inside, he turns on the lights and begins to dust. Kirkpatrick opens the cash register and closes it, rings the bell hanging above the door to hear it ring, begins to unlock the lock, the rows of locks hanging from the wall on hooks, wraps his index finger in a cloth, unlocks each box, and moves his finger to clean each dark corner. A woman wrapped in blankets wanders in and out. Kirkpatrick follows her to the street where she shivers. Thick, wet blisters pock her neck, even though it is not cold, it is not warm. She walks toward the slow smoke, still riveting through the air. Kirkpatrick fingers the wine cork he carries in his right hand's pocket. Kirkpatrick checks the time on his watch and winds it. It had been his son's watch. After a day in the empty store, after the soot rises from the railroad shop smokestacks, fingering the sky to cover the sun, after Kirkpatrick has closed the door and locked every lock, he will walk the filthy street for the new Model B he will borrow from Kirkpatrick, who has hidden a keg of beer in the back of the car beneath a horsehair blanket. He will drive away from the dusk of downtown, rumbling through yellow fields into the hills where we, he will turn down a gravel road, almost too narrow for the car, until he comes to a baseball field hidden in the hills among trees beneath a bluer sky. Kirkpatrick will help Kirkpatrick roll the keg to the improvised seats, and the crowd will crowd around them, holding their steins and wait for a drink. They will listen to the crack of a baseball hit long into the woods. Late, after darkness has ended the game, after the keg has emptied, Kirkpatrick will drive Kirkpatrick down the road, meandering down the hill and back into the city. They'll pass the murky light of the railroad shops, the rolling mill, an empty coal train a mile long waiting to go into the mountains. They will make a stop at a white turned gray row house, walk around back to the cellar door, and in the basement bar have another round. Kirkpatrick will drive Kirkpatrick home on back roads. Kirkpatrick will die quietly sleeping, the sky clear and black and cold for the first time in months. Kirkpatrick will die sleeping, the sky cold and clear and black, a memory of Kirkpatrick felt a stone in his shoe intermittently as not a sharp pain, but something dull like a thumb pushing into the arch of his foot. He shook his foot as he walked to jostle the stone into the, some safe place in his shoe, not wanting to stop and be caught in the rain. He ran across the street, the headlamps of a car emerging through the thick rain. Walking home beyond dusk, arms heavy with groceries, the second hottest summer on record, she can feel the grocery bag slipping from her arms, stops to adjust them back into the proper position. The dog barks from behind the fence. Kirkpatrick walks on the gravel sidewalk of the long, steep slope toward her home. She takes the shortcut, a long concrete staircase overgrown with vines bisecting two long, empty lots. She hears something crawling through the grove and stops to adjust her bags and catch her breath. She feels the cold sweat on her back. With 22 steps to go, she stands and checks the grocery bags to make sure they won't break and continues. A bird calls to her from the thin, bare branch of a dead and dry oak. At the top of the stairs, a block from home, she can smell the smoke of her neighbor's grill. When she gets home, she'll take a glass of water onto the back porch and say hello, and ask them what they're cooking. They'll offer her some of the chicken they're grilling, and she'll thank them because it's much too hot to cook. Kirkpatrick will sit in the green glider beneath the awning, and she'll smile at the children laughing and shouting, running in circles in the shade of the neighbor's back lawn as the sun begins to set. She'll go to bed early, exhausted from the heat, and as she falls asleep, she will wonder if she's put the milk away or left it on the counter and decides that if she's forgotten, it's too late. One last drink, one more dance before a sobering walk around the block. A knife across the throat, trachea, esophagus lacerated. Pneumonia, influenza, tuberculosis. A day after another day, Kirkpatrick up in bed, in darkness, something tapping against the window, something fluttering against the inside of his chest, some pain boring out of him, pushing against his sternum, trying to escape, something strangling his lungs, short, quick breaths, Kirkpatrick beside him, something like sleep and at the same time not asleep, survived by Kirkpatrick, Kirkpatrick a year to the day later, in bed on the quietest night, alone. A reactor explodes, an airplane crashes, a dam breaks, a train derails. A bacterial infection, a bacterial meningitis, syphilitic complication, head pain, fever, fear of light, fear of darkness, a dusting of snow, 
thin, invisible ice, a power line down, a seizure, a deer dead, frozen in the road. Survived by a 16-acre apple orchard, survived by an herb garden long succumbed to mint, survived by an empty doghouse rotting, survived by a dull kitchen knife in the kitchen sink, the residue of a solitary dinner, a plate on the end table, the blue light of the television, the dust-covered drapes, a clear vinyl path through the living room to the bedroom over the pristine white carpet, a collection of minuscule glass animals, grass unmowed, a rhubarb patch untended, a five-gallon bucket full of broken glass, a red car in a white garage, asphalt in need of patching, 17 hidden Bibles stuffed with photographs of Kirkpatrick and Kirkpatrick and Kirkpatrick, brittle and torn, so thick the Bible bindings broken, the leather covers hanging by the end papers. Inflamed heart sometimes leads to explosion. A freight power poured from the toaster oven to the outlet on the wall, an abandoned nest of crows in the chimney. Kirkpatrick aged 74 years, seven months and 20 days. Beloved mother, friend and lover, peacefully passed, left this life, left this presence, returned to heaven, left this world, embraced family, loved by her family, loving mother and grandmother, lived righteously, charitable, active, outgoing, retired, worked, lived, dedicated, survived, suffered complications, a viewing will be held. Kirkpatrick could not remember being born and will not remember dying, the last deep breath, the last short, shrill inhalation, unsatisfying, wanting just one more. The lack of light or darkness, the feeling of the soul pounding against the inside of the ribcage, desperately looking for some secret escape, the feeling of the thick, hard pillow on the back of the skull, the tired, stiff neck, the feeling of being bedridden for three days that felt so long but were not long enough, the taste of broth and salt and something bland like potatoes or oatmeal, the feeling of swallowing, the feeling of water on the lips, the feeling of trying to sit up in bed, the feeling of fighting sleep as if every last noticed thing is something to savor, struggling to tell another story, the smell of Kirkpatrick like something withering, the feeling of overwhelming warmth, the sound of laughter in the kitchen downstairs, the smell of bacon in the morning and something roasting in the oven at night, the feel of a hand on her forehead, the feeling of fingers intertwining her own fingers, the feeling of a whisper on her earlobe, the sound of a crow calling from outside the window, the sound of geese flying overhead, a blurred V transforming in the gray sky, the sound of leaves shaking and falling from the tree, the window cracked, the smell of impending winter, the smell of cold, thirst, a vision, a memory, a moment when a little air in the lungs is no longer enough. Between 62 and 78 million die in the Second World War. Between 30 and 60 million die during the Mongol conquests. Between 10 and 100 million die during European conquests in the Americas. 913 die in the Jonestown Revolutionary Suicide. Shampoa Tiger, Tsavo Man Eaters, Leopard of Rudra Prayag, Tigers of Chagar, Queen of the Sea Train Disaster, Modane Train Disaster, Approximately 12 billion dead, Estimated number of souls in heaven, 144,000. Kirkpatrick, after four beers, climbs onto the roof and balances a ladder in the crook of a maple tree in the backyard. He wraps the electric chainsaw around his shoulder by the power cord and steps onto a thick branch, tests the ladder, and begins to climb. At the top of the ladder, he looks across the lawn and can see his neighbor, her long body naked in the window, combing her hair, watching him. He will climb one more rung of the ladder. He will start the chainsaw and chew through a thick branch, the chainsaw too small and clogged for the job. He will look again into his neighbor's window and she will be standing there still, her breasts, her stomach and arms. He will remember the way he stumbled over his words. The chainsaw will jump and kick and the ladder will vibrate in the branch and he will wrap the tangled power cord over his shoulder and behind his neck to avoid slicing through it and he will again wonder why he bought an electric chainsaw why he bought something so small, why he planted so many trees so close to the house on such a small lot. He will not look up because he knows she is there still, watching him. He will feel the ladder sliding, will feel his foot slipping, feel the cord draped around his body, tightening around his neck. Vaccines, plague, cholera, diphtheria, flu. Seal houses against birds and drafts. Wash hands often. Ignore dogs. Protect dreams from death and birth. Never touch the dead. Eat vegetables, protect the skin, prevent eye twitching. Do not hold funerals on Fridays. Do not count cars. 
Wear well-worn clothes. Remove clocks and mirrors. Do not eat in groups of three or 13. Hang umbrellas carefully. Rise early. Avoid rats, snakes, turtles, butterflies, and all birds. <laughs> Kirkpatrick left his mortal life, survived, proceeded, suffered, fissured, died. Severe weakness, fever, abscess, pus, fluid accumulation, disturbed functionality, a bird in the house, a crow in the cupboard, a crow's gaze, crow's calling, crows, robin through window, a clock turning backward with a mirror shattering, thunder indicates reckoning, weeds grow over trapped souls, parsley, vultures, Seagulls in the number three, roosters, daylight owls, banshees, horse sounds, dogs, black dogs, strange fish, falling stars, clotted water, stop clocks, light one candle for every dead, dead ancestor. Heart stops beating, lungs stop breathing, blood no longer circulates. Pale gray, bruised, then blue, cells line up and die, decay, the soul escapes or fails to escape. Bacteria eats the organs. Enzymes exit the intestine and stomach and devour the body. Cells consume cells. Flies lay eggs in mouth, nose, ears, wounds. Putrefy. Inflation, insects. The body blackens and liquefies. The body dries. The soul's last chance. A name in stone eroding. Thank you.